Good morning. It is now noon. My name is Henry Sikalski, Executive Director of the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center. As you may have seen and read in the announcement for this event, if you thought our problems in East Asia are as bad as they can get, short of a nuclear war, there's more. Imagine the disputes that China has with Taiwan and Japan, and now with South Korea, and the disputes South Korea has with Japan and China, and the disputes Japan has with South Korea and China, plus the aggravation of North Korea, and then add in each one of the countries several thousand bombs worth of plutonium. That sounds like a good, good additive. I mean, we didn't have it bad enough. We need something to make the crisis worse. Now, this has not yet happened, but I should go further to say it doesn't have to. A few candid words between Japan and the U.S., plus some candid words with China, and perhaps, finally, if necessary, with South Korea. And at least the worst part of this could be put off. But time is running out. Now, it is our job in the NGO world to be annoying. I like to think I, I do my job. But it seems that large organizations like governments, their job is to put people like me off. So I need help. We all need help. That's why we're here today. You have a statement that was signed in February. It says PUPO, which I guess is reference to plutonium policy. I'm getting a nod by the person who came probably up with that rather obscure title. Take a look at that statement. You will see it again. If you look carefully at the end of it, you'll see a rather interesting signature. His name is Taro Kono. <laughs> if you haven't kept up with your Google News, he is now the Foreign Minister of Japan. If you want to know what he actually thinks privately, it's right there. That was before he was Foreign Minister. Well, you know, you, you become important, you can't tell people what you think. But if you're not, you sign statements like this. And he did. <laughs> the reason I bring this up is because if you want to know what our Japanese guests want, it may be difficult because anyone who knows anyone who's Japanese knows they're very polite people, extremely polite, maybe too polite. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought we would have in writing the recommendations of what they really think as well and what they want us to do. Because they're here not to just tell you that they are troubled. Undoubtedly they are. But because they want help. They want us to behave as though we are in a cooperative nuclear agreement which we are, that's going to renew, which it will next year, that allows for consultations and that we should talk. Now, one person is not here today, Senator Adachi. He was here yesterday, but he went home. But he was with this group. And he is LDP, that is uh, Liberal Democratic Party, that is, he is with the ruling party. The ruling party, I have to tell you, says everything's going fine. Please ignore any problems we have. Our plutonium program will sort out. But he came on the trip because he didn't think that was so. 
he said, no, it doesn't look like the objectives of this program are going to be met if we keep doing what we're doing. We need to pause. We need to stop. We need to rethink what we're doing. Okay. Now, there were a lot of speakers, so I said, no, I've got to do all the speaking. You can't have any time. And so we cut it down to two speakers besides me. Masa Odo is a journalist and visiting professor at the Nagasaki University. He is quite an expert, as you'll see. And uh, let's make sure we have everything yep. out. Yes. Fiji Osaka. Yes, Mr. Osaka. We should say House of Deputy Osaka. He is uh, part of the Democratic Party, that's the opposition, but he's also an expert. He's a senior member of the Special Committee on Nuclear Affairs. Now, there is a third person that we're going to hear from over the screen, all the way from Livermore, and that is Bruce Goodwin. He's last. What he's going to do is put an explosive exclamation point on this presentation. He's a bomb designer. There are not many left. He'll tell you what you can do with the plutonium, just to keep you focused on why we're here. Sir. All right. Thank you very much, Henry. And also, uh, thank you very much for coming, everybody, distinguished guest. We are two, two polite Japanese on the stage right now. And uh, it's uh, just an overwhelming moment for me when I was a Washington correspondent almost 15 years. Mr. Hyde, he's a chairman, big non-proliferation fighter. And uh, Mr. Lampos, he's a big fighter of the human rights. Both of them, gentlemen, gathered a lot of respect from my nations, from my free. So I just want to say thank you, first of all, for US Congress. Thank you very much for your great service and the dedication to the security and the peace in our region. Thank you very much, sir, and ladies. Thank you. Uh, I just want to give some overview why we came here by Pakistan delegation, including a leading majority party, and also Mr. Osaka is a leading minority party. Why we came here? Because we have a big problem. We have a big, tough challenge. We have a big predicament right now. What it is, huge stockpile of plutonium, thanks to privilege, special light given by US Congress and the US administration back in 1980s. I want to tell you why plutonium is a, such a big problem. First, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, many people in the world believe plutonium economy can work, could be functional sometimes in the future. Reprocessing a spent fuel coming from the reactor, this spent fuel would be reprocessed for creating a plutonium. And this plutonium could be used for mox fuel. And this mox fuel can be burned again at the light water reactors. Before Fukushima nuclear disaster, we had 54 nuclear reactors. But currently, only five reactors are running right now because of the strong negative opinion against the uh, nuclear power generation among the Japanese public. But 40 years ago, people believed plutonium economy. We can make it. Plutonium can be useful, sustainable resources for future you know, energy generation. But now, because of the uh, poor management, of the uh, entire close fuel cycle policy by Japanese utilities and also Japanese government, I think. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a polite Japanese, but sometimes should be critical against the uh, policy. So I emphasize that. 
So, plutonium economy is not viable anymore. Moxville should have been used for light reactors and also fast breeder reactors. Fast breeder reactors can reproduce plutonium. So we can produce plutonium as an energy source forever. This is the original you know, picture of the Japanese government and the Japanese utility companies starting back in 1956. It's a long time ago. But first breeder project was killed by current administration, Mr. Abe, great friend of Mr. Trump. Abe administration decided to kill this FBR project, Monju, which is a prototype FBR, because Monju became a big liability in terms of the politics and the economy. We cannot afford this program anymore. And that means uh, you know, unpopular among the Japanese public. That might be a political liability for current administration of Japan. So that's the reason why we killed this program. So now we have 47 metric ton of a separated proton, which is a weapon usable material. You know, this topic will be discussed by uh, Mr. Gutmann later. So uh, now, as I said, there are only five reactors running, and three of five can consume plutonium. How much plutonium can be consumed by three reactors? Maximum, around one metric ton annually. So we don't know how many MOX reactors can be stirred you know, even facing the, uh, such a tough negative opinion among the public. Some experts <coughs> estimate, at the best, maximum nine reactors. Mr. Dachi, uh, LDP, LDP diet members, explained that his estimate is a nine or 10, maybe nine. My estimate is at eight or nine. So anyway, eight or nine MOX reactor can consume plutonium three, to form four metric ton annually. We have a 47 metric ton of plutonium right now. No FBR project. If FBR project was still alive, FBR can consume a huge amount of plutonium. But this project was killed, okay? So this is the uh, one problem, economic liability. You know, it's a uh, cost of the uh, reprocessing and the fuel cycle system, close the fuel cycle system, it's a very expensive than the uh, once through system, once through cycle, as the United States has taken so long time. Next problem, why plutonium is a problem? Second point is a security implication. Huge amount of plutonium might be vulnerable to a nuclear terrorism. Safe. So, uh, Nuclear security is our next concern. And the next one is implication for the uh, entire region in East Asia. If Japan maintains such huge stockpile of plutonium, what would China react? What would South Korea react? South Korea has been pursuing their own fuel cycle system they try to succeed a pyro processing, another type of the reprocessing. There is some argument, you know, whether pyro is a reprocessing or not, but the anyway, they are pursuing their own fuel cycle. During this process, they need a plutonium. They, in this process, if they want, they can process, reprocess a plutonium if they want. And the China is now thinking about the construction of the commercial scale of the reprocessing plant, commercial scale. It's the same type as Aomori's Lokasha facility. So there is a potentiality. There is a no nuclear arms race in the region, but the uh, plutonium production competition might be going on, I'm afraid. So this is the second point. More plutonium, more usable weapon, more nuclear weapon usable materials means uh, less security and less safety, more vulnerability in the region. Okay, 
platform. <laughs> and the last point is our, uh, what I should say, uh, we are Japan, leading nation of the uh, nuclear disarmament and the non-proliferation. I'm sorry to say that 72 years ago, I'm a visiting professor of Nagasaki. Just my mentor who survived the aid of drop 72 years ago, passed away two weeks ago, whose name is Dr. Tsuchiyama, president of the Nagasaki University. He taught me a lot why we have to pursue the nuclear free world. As President Obama strongly vindicated, he went to Hiroshima last year. One of the reasons why confirmation of the U.S. commitment to nuclear disarmament and the non-proliferation. Japan is a good ally to the U.S. and we are leading the nation of the nuclear non-proliferation. But 47 metric tons of plutonium, and then next year, new reprocessing facility in Lokasho may start operation. That means our additional plutonium coming from a reprocessing plant. Maybe, I don't know the number, but the maximum eight ton annually. It's another big number. So Japan should be a leading nation by non-proliferation. We should stand on the higher moral ground on this area. But what we have been doing is undermining our credibility. That's my end work. So uh, we have a big problem in our backyard. We need engagement of specialists like him. No, you don't. No, you don't. And uh, <laughs> congressional people. Congressional people. Congressional not people. <laughs> Thanks to our special right given by US 123 agreement, allow you, Japan, to reprocess. 30 years, 47 metric ton. You are proven. So please engage yourself. Okay. okay. We're banking on your being even more polite. More polite. <laughs> I want to finish by the end. You have five, ten minutes, but that's it. Okay. Go. All right. Uh, my name is Seiji Osaka. I'm a member of uh, the Diet House of Representatives. Uh, it is a great honor for me uh, as a Japanese diet member to speak uh, at this forum today. Mr. Osaka has spoken with us very long. さて、しかしながら日本が今プルトニウムを
47頭もプルトニウムを抱えていて、日本が核武装をするなどということは、これはほぼ 100% ありえないことであります。しかしながら、抱え込んでいることによって、さまざまな憶測を呼ぶ、そのことが世界の安全保障に悪い影響を及ぼす、これは必至だと思います。先ほど太田さんから説明があったとおり、この47トンのプルトニウムを発電に使うのはほぼ難しい状況であります。したがって私は、このプルトニウムのあり方について別な方法を考える必要があると思っています。今回、ワン・ツー・スリー・アグリーメントが30年の満期を迎えるにあたって、これをチャンスと捉えて、この日米間、特に日米の関係が私は大事だと思いますけれども、この両国で日本の47トンのプルトニウムのあり方について検討を開始する、そういうきっかけにできればと思っています。時間がありませんので簡単に日本がなぜ47トンものプルトニウムを抱えることになったかその経過だけをお話しします。その大きな理由は核燃料サイクルこれについて十分な検証がないままに核燃料サイクルに踏み込んでいるということだと思います。一つ、経済性はどうなのか、二つ、環境への影響はどうなのか、核燃料サイクルが本当に実現可能性のあるものなのか、あるいは安全保障に与える影響はどうなのか、こういった各点について、必ずしも十分な議論がない中で、核燃料サイクルをやるんだということで、プルトニウムをため込んでしまった、そしてその上に2018年に再処理工場が稼働する、これは決していい状況だとは思われません。日本がこうした残念な道のりを歩んでしまったこと、これは事実でありますけれども、だがしかし目の前にあるプルトニウム、この問題を考えないわけにはいきません。私の発言はこれで終わりますけれども、プルトニウムのこの先行き、これを皆さんと共に考えていきたい、そのことを申し上げて終わりにします。
concluding presentation is going to come by way of FaceTime. <laughs> and we are being hooked into the state of extreme well-being, that's California. And is it working? It needs a second to warm up. <laughs> is that credible or not? <laughs> oh, a book. Oh. All right. This is Bruce Goodwin. Uh, he has uh, the dubious distinction of being the last person to fix some of our nuclear weapons so that they work. He got an award for this. And I say dubious because no one else is getting awards now doing this. So we're talking to someone who actually knows something about weapons design. And he's a student of another person who is very famous as well, and that's Robert Selden, who you may know if you know much about plutonium. He also was a weapons designer. Bruce, uh, inform us about these things. The, you'll notice that in your package of items that you sat on, there is a, a number of view graphs, and he will call out which view graph he's talking about. That's it, you've got it, yes. So you can follow along. Bruce, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay. All right. Let me, let me start with the disinformation view graph, which is the first one in your pile. Um, and for instance, uh, from Japanese industry, advocacy that nuclear weapons can be made from plutonium extracted from electricity generating power reactors would be too innocent a notion, I wish it were. From the World Nuclear Organization, um, any significant proportion of 240 plutonium in it, in it being a nuclear weapon would make it hazardous to both the bomb maker as well as probably unreliable and unpredictable. I'll address each one of those three points of hazard and unreliability and unpredictability. And then finally, the even Wikipedia on reactor grade plutonium um, says that this issue is somewhat debated. Uh, the one place it isn't debated is, is amongst nuclear weapons designers. Plutonium is obviously man-made, produced in reactors from uranium, and there are many isotopes. The issue here between reactor grade and weapons grade is that reactor grade has a very, uh, sort of a four to five times higher percentage of plutonium-240 in it, and plutonium-240 is much more radioactive, produces many more neutrons than 239, and this is the crux of the question that keeps being repeated here. So the three aspects that I will address, which make it quite, which are not issues, uh, but are presented as issues for nuclear weapons, is the reactivity of, uh, of, of reactor grade plutonium, how critical can it become, the ease of handling, that is its radioactivity and its heat generation, and finally the performance controlling issue, the neutron background, or the spontaneous fission rate of plutonium, reactor grade plutonium. So if we look at reactivity, uh, if you look at view graph number five, um, the most, the simplest way to compare reactivity is to look at the bare critical mass of plutonium. And, and I have a list here of, of four uh, usable materials. Uh, weapons grade, the critical mass is 11 kilograms, obviously quite usable. Reactor grade, the critical mass is 13, less than 20% higher, quite usable. Uh, uranium-233 and highly enriched uranium are, are higher, uh, but clearly highly enriched uranium has been used in nuclear weapons, so this is far from an issue. Um, and the reason that people tend to obfuscate or confuse or create disinformation is on the next view graph, number six. What I've plotted here is the cross-section which uh, for, for the, the blue line is essentially weapons-grade plutonium, the green line uh, is uh, plutonium-240, which is what makes reactor-grade plutonium, reactor-grade plutonium. Um, and you can see that in a reactor-240, uh, at, the, at the bottom of the view graph on the left there, has almost no fission cross-section. So in a reactor, it acts as a poison. Uh, it 
blows down the reactor and people take this fact and say, well, you can't use it for a weapon. The problem is that a weapon operates at a much higher neutron energy, what's called fast or bomb thermal energy, and that's in the middle of this chart. And you can see that the green and blue lines are almost on top of each other at that point. So the irony here is that reactor-grade plutonium is bad in a reactor, but just fine in a nuclear weapon. We go to the next uh, view graph, which is number seven. Uh, how difficult is it to handle reactor-grade plutonium? Well, the way to look at that is how much radioactivity, how many neutrons, and how much heat does it put out? And you can see that between reactor and weapon, weapons grade, the difference is about a factor of three to five. And quite honestly, engine, nuclear engineers are quite adept at handling these levels of reactivity. Uh, you would need factors of 10 or 100 difference in order to cause a serious hazard for handling. And if you're building a new facility, you build that in, and so there's essentially no problem between reactor grade and weapons grade in terms of handling the, either the weapon or the uh, making of the weapon. And finally, neutron background, which is the quote performance uh, disturbing issue. It's important here because it can influence when the explosive chain reaction starts in a nuclear weapon. Uh, the condition is technically called pre-initiation or starting it too soon. And it is always cited in the various uh, arguments for not being usable as the problem because it, it, it will make the yield too low. Now the number of neutrons present in, from reaction rate is in fact five times higher. And as a result, you have a statistically lower distribution of yields from such a weapon. But let me just cut to the chase here. Uh, the concluding slide here, or the second to the last slide, um, a military useful first generation, meaning something like the, the Nagasaki weapon, a first generation nuclear explosive using reactor grade plutonium can be designed to produce nuclear yields in the multi kiloton range. And with reactor grade plutonium, there is a minimum possible yield, and that is a kiloton. And the most probable yield is very much larger than one kiloton. And even at one kiloton, that weapon would have a destructive radius much greater than one third of the destructive radius that occurred at Hiroshima. So this, this is quite usable and quite a serious weapon if you make uh, such a weapon out of reactor grade plutonium. So I will quote now from the United States government uh, Department of Energy publication from 1997, which very explicitly says that Nuclear weapons from reactor-grade plutonium would have an assured reliable yield of one or a few kilotons and probably a significantly higher yield than that. And further, that if you go beyond the sort of crude weapon that was used in Nagasaki, an advanced nuclear weapon state such as the U.S. or Russia, using modern designs, could produce weapons from reactor-grade plutonium having reliable explosive yield, weight, and other characteristics generally comparable to those of weapons made from weapons-grade plutonium. Having done this myself, I can tell you that this is quite true. And uh, I suspect that the uh, industrial states of Asia would um, be capable of, similarly to the United States and Russia, in making such weapons. And that's pretty much what I have to say, Henry. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you have no idea how difficult it was a few years ago to make this brief available to you, but I'm glad that it now is available to everyone, and uh, I think it's definitive. Uh, we now have the best time of the uh, meeting, and that is for questions. Uh, if you can raise your hand and stand up, I'd ask that you simply identify who you are with your affiliation and pose your question. At this time, I'd like the rest of the Japanese delegation uh, to come up into the empty chairs, if you would, so that you can answer the questions 
if, if appropriate. Okay. I'm sorry. No. One, if, please come forward. But meanwhile, yeah, this is not, this is not mysterious. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Questions. Now, don't all rush at once. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to. <laughs> What's the matter with you people? Surely you have. There we go. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm Dave Fitzgerald, retired uh, State Department. I have a question about uh, the, the nuclear uh, reactor industry and the degree to which you need a viable number of reactors in a country in order to have an economically feasible nuclear uh, program. Is there any number that comes to mind that's, that's available, uh, either from the American experience or the Japanese experience? Could you, could you rephrase that question and ask how many reactors you might need to justify having certain kinds of fuel cycle activities? Well, that might be one way to approach that. That, that they can answer, I think. By the way, it, depending on what you, what you, how you feel in the morning, well, one might be enough, 200 might not be enough. But the, the question that I rephrased, that has a specific answer. Well, but how do you produce the economies uh, to make the whole thing viable if you don't have enough reactors to begin with? Well, it, it, that That's the problem that That's Japan right. faces now, isn't That's it? That's right. Yeah, well, how shall I put it? Uh, there's Subjective answers and highly subjective answers. <laughs> Why don't you try answering both questions? Let me, let me, okay. Yeah, just based on the reality on the ground, after the Fukushima nuclear disaster, you know, the 60% majority of the uh, Japanese, according to a public poll by done by the media, 60% majority are saying uh, we want to see phase out of entire nuclear generation. Not right now. Some people say that we should shut down all of nuclear power plants right now. You know, it's uh, maybe 10% or 50%, but the rest of the uh, 40, 50 majorities are saying uh, we want to see the uh, phase down, phase out all nuclear generation in the future. So Fukushima nuclear disaster might become a trauma for entire Japanese public for going nuclear again. Uh, so this is a reality on the ground. And the credibility of the uh, nuclear policy of Japan, Japanese government and the utility company, was totally destroyed because of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Before disaster, government, utility, you know, try to, they want Japanese public to understand that there won't be any severe accident. That's the reason why there are poor, you know, arrangements poor coordination, poor readiness for severe accident like a Fukushima nuclear disaster. And collusion between utility companies and the regulatory authorities, and the collusion between the promoter of the uh, governmental organization and the regulator of the uh, governmental organization. These factors are totally undermine and uh, maybe destroy the whole confidence and the trust of the uh, Japanese nuclear policy. This, you know, losing trust is not restored yet. That's a fundamental problem. So, uh, you are right. You know, based on the ground, it's not sustainable. It's not viable. You know, any policy need a potency of the uh, public. Any, you know, single, maybe especially major policy needs a potency of the uh, nation, students, you know. So, uh, and the current situation, it's probably difficult for Japanese authority to sustain the status quo. Did anyone else here want to answer? Yes. No. Why, don't, why don't you introduce yourself as well in Japanese? Aomori Ken, no Koshi Mura no Chikaku ni Sunzeri, Misawa no Yamada to Moshimasu. Hang on. まあ、日本原年の社長が
箇所の再処理工場で取り出すプルトニウムは核兵器に使えないといつも言っています。だから今日のようなアメリカの方々からのお話というのは、私たちにとってはやはり日本の6カ所、再処理工場は核兵器を持つために使われる可能性も大きいということを教えていただいています。IAEA も教科書の中で、モックス燃料でも核兵器を作れるということは書いてあるんですけども、日本原燃の社長はこれを否定してきています。だから今日のような皆さんからの教示は私たちにとってやはり六箇所再処理工場の危険性をですねもっと高める認識を深めさせていただいたということに大変感謝しています。Other questions? Okay, Mr. Holt, stand up. We need to identify you. Mark Holt, Congressional Research Service. Um, I wanted to ask Dr. Goodwin is there a problem with uh, americium buildup in uh, reactor grade plutonium and making weapons? Let's see. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, here we go again. What, what do I need to do to make sound happen? He's going to come over. He just oh, started. Ryan. He should he, be all set with sound. He's speaking. Okay. No, there we go. Okay. Yeah. You, can, you can hear me, right? Could yes. You the question for me? The re question is, what about americium? Isn't that? Yes. Uh, you know, there are a number of isotopes that, or elements that can be used to make nuclear weapons. Um, I, you know, the one that americium is probably becoming is not something one can necessarily go after just because it has much less availability than say reactor grade plutonium. No, I think it was the concern that it would be a poison. Ah, if you look at the isotope, the isotopic distribution in reactor grade plutonium, it, that doesn't become an issue. Um, I should point out that the United States actually tested the reactor grade plutonium device in the early 1960s in the Bush response. Mark, does that answer the question, or okay? Yes. Hi, Jim Warner, also with CRS. Question, also back to Bruce uh, Goodwin. Um, <clears throat> at, at the outset, I, I think it's uh, hopefully not unobjective to say that those one of the more concise summaries of the issue that we've heard. And as, as Henry said, it's difficult to get that information out in such a clear way. Um, I worked on the project with DOE um, that released that information. You just mentioned, Bruce, the uh, report of plutonium in the first 50 years that disclosed those tests. And I guess the question for us now in 2017 is to what extent is, if, if you're able to speak to this at all, Bruce, how much is Livermore working um, with other agencies on this question with regard to 123 agreements and other nuclear agreements? and the, the role of that, and sort of informing it with that sort of technical background that has not always been out there. Can you able to speak to that role with uh, either Livermore or DOE with other agencies and what the, what the discussion is on the nuclear cooperation agreements? Uh, I'm going to have to apologize. The echo in your room makes it hard for me to understand. Henry, did you... Uh, well, rephrasing. He's asking, does anybody ask you or the people around you to what extent are nuclear cooperative uh, 
uh, programs. Gen 4, I'm speculating. Uh, advanced fuel cycle cooperation from the labs is actually uh, a risk or not? Um, over the years, we we obviously have have had uh, been asked and had input into various agreements. Um, I'm not all that familiar with with things recently, uh, but again, the the U.S. government certainly does consult with the experts on these things when they come up. Does or does not? Does. 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 They just don't ask you, Mr. Walker. But they ask, they ask the labs. They ask the labs in general, yes. Ms. Squassoni? Shannon Squassoni from uh, CSIS and formerly from CRS. <laughs> <laughs> you can see a trend developing here. <laughs> so I have a comment and a question. My comment is that the Japan Nuclear Cooperation Agreement is almost unique um, in this automatic extension. And it was a very deliberate move on the part of the US government many years ago. I see no incentives for this Trump administration, or for that matter, the Obama administration, really, to create any problems with Japan. Um, and bureaucratic inertia being what it is, <laughs> I think there will be a, a, a much stronger momentum just to do nothing. But the U.S. Congress is supposed to, you know, is the guardian of trade, right? And you have a role to review these cooperation agreements. And even if you don't have a role, in extending or revising this agreement, you should hold hearings on this. But there may be other ideas that come from our panel in terms of what Congress could do. There's a, there's a range of things. Reporting requirements, you could uh, request a report back from the Trump administration on consultations. You know, there are a lot of annoying things you could ask the administration to do to make sure that uh, people are paying attention to what that plutonium surplus is and how it is going to be resolved. So it's more of a comment than a question, but I throw it back to the panelists to see if they have any reaction. Well, because the panel consists of experts on the American government system, you're talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> well, how shall I put it? Let me, let me, yeah, now they'll get a chance, but let me give you an answer based on somebody that works on American government issues rather than Japanese. First, I would reverse your interpretation a bit. I don't think it's quite correct. It's fair enough to say there's a lot of willingness to do nothing, by the way, in both branches. I, I don't think it's unique to the executive. However, I would not agree at all with the characterization that an administration who has put primary interest and emphasis on dealing with North Korea is tone deaf to the uh, alliance, military alliance implications of opening up Rakasha. This is not a balance issue. This is not something you get reports on. They turn that machine on and one gram goes through that thing. And I can assure you from the conversations I've had with people in the Blue House and in Beijing, there will be a political military reaction to that thing being turned on. Now, you don't agree, but let me tell you, when you talk to people like the National Security Advisor to the President in the case of Korea, they have a rather strong view about this. They don't want to see it turn on unless they get a chance to turn something on themselves. You don't want to be without your own if they give forward. That was made very clear to me. Now, there is no way the piling of plutonium in these two countries is going to go without some kind of response from China. They have not cited, they cannot seem to find a site quite yet to build, but they will. And if Japan goes forward, 
there's every reason to believe that will get solved much more quickly. Now, the Trump administration and the executive has to be concerned about this. And I can tell you from the conversations I've had with certain individuals in the administration, there are some people who do care about this. The role of Congress, it seems to me, is to mobilize those people to get through to the top. And I think they can do that. But it's not just with reporting about balances. The issue actually is less balanced than it is initiation of Rakasha. And everyone likes to cover that up because METE, which is the Japanese organization behind this particular plutonium project, would have you believe it's all about how much we consume and how much uh, you know, we produce. And if there's a balance, and that no one should worry themselves. I can assure you the South Koreans and, and the Chinese do not trust the Japanese. And therefore, they don't care as much about balance as whether or not Rakasha turns on and has the potential to be turned up at any time. And I think we are waltzing past this. I know our own energy department and some of the people most vocal on this issue want you to believe it's just about balance. It's not. And I think this is the hard reality we're whistling past. Now, the good news is, from what I'm hearing from the experts, incompetence at the Rakasho site might prevent it from opening anyway for quite a while. And if we're really fortunate, they won't know how to make it work. But I wouldn't bank on that. Actually, in that regard, could you comment? Because we have an expert from the Yamori uh, Prefecture who knows a lot about the facility. ロカシモ最初に工場は着工から 私たちの希望じゃなくて会社の希望です。新しい規制に沿った申請書が出て半年で工場再開許可が出ると思ってました。半年。ところが3年、3年を過ぎてもう 3年 え、9 
そして最近、ブラン濃縮工場や低レベル放射性廃棄物の埋設施設など、もうすでに二十数年動いているものの中で、トラブルが起きて、またこれも止めるようになりました。こういう会社が本当に再処理を40年間継続して運転できるかどうかやっていいかどうか私たちは大変危惧しています。10年,年ほど前に10年ほど前にアクティブ試験を行いましたけれども工場を運転する前に過去に使った配管 1300km の配管の点検をしなければいけないと社長は言ってますが、まだ点検は一度もされていません。開館。アクティブラット。Yeah, and at this time we're speaking about the そして青森県は青森県民はですね世論調査でいつも 80% 程度が再処理工場に反対だとこれは1985年の受け入れを決めて翌年のチェルノブイリ原発事故を経験してからずっと一貫して再処理工場に懸念を示しています。そして皆さんの。そして皆さんの同僚で住んでる三沢米軍基地は再処理工場から三十キロしか離れていません。そして砂漠撃場が砂漠撃場が再処理工場から十キロの地点でいつも砂漠撃訓練がされています。十キロ。そして最初に工場の上空を戦闘機が飛ぶこともあります。ですからさまざまな問題があって、私たち青森県民としては、そんなに急いで再処理をする必要がないんだったらやめてほしいと思います。There we go, Florence. <laughs> Florence Lodi, Global America Business Institute. Um, we know there's a large amount of stockpile of the community. 
and there could be a potential regional or domestic conflict or against it or, uh, with the Rokasha coming alive. So what do we do? Is there some sort of recommendation, suggestion, consensus, and moving forward? Oh, your paper. No, okay. no, no, no. It's not mine. I did not write this. Oh, okay. I signed it. This is a paper that was signed by the foreign, current foreign minister of Japan, everyone on this panel, people from the United States. And the two things that they recommend, by the way, this is a great question. <laughs> We've got to end on, well, what, what, what are we going to do about this? The two recommendations that stand out, there are a number of others, which is we, we, we need to have our nuclear experts in Japan and the US talk about ways of storing spent fuel, ways of disposing of separated plutonium, because the United States has this problem too. We should consult in ways of doing it without recycling, and there are a number of ways. But in addition, it says, the governments of Japan with those of China and Korea should commit to a reprocessing moratorium in order to prevent plutonium accumulation of separated plutonium in Northeast Asia. Japan's government should lead the way, well, I don't know, maybe the United States should lead the way, but someone should lead the way, by indefinitely postponing the startup of Rokasho. The second is conduct comprehensive reviews during the moratorium and pause on all aspects of their nuclear fuel cycle policies. That means Korea and China as well. Investigating an alternatives for spent fuel storage and disposal. And then it goes on to say that all of the people on this panel should be hired at very high fees to tell them what to do. It, it doesn't quite say that, but it says reviews should involve independent third-party views, which I, I, I think is self-serving. But it doesn't have to be that way. It can be just the government experts. Um, in any case, it, you, you want to take this time to get this right. I mean, I know in Korea there's a big controversy because of the president's views as to what to do, not with recycling, but with nuclear power. In China, they had only one new start this year. They had 10,000 people hit the streets complaining about the construction of their reprocessing plant almost a year ago. They're petrified. They can't figure out where to do the siting. I don't have to explain the problems Japan has, and even the United States is struggling with its Savannah River project. The one thing that President Obama and President Trump apparently agree on, and perhaps the only thing, is to terminate that project. Now, whether or not Congress will come to this view anytime soon is a separate matter. But I think this is a historic moment to reason together. It's not our nature to do this, but we have this option. And that, I think, is the plea. And perhaps we can convince our executive to ask for just those kinds of reasoning consultations, starting with Japan. It's allowed under the agreement on the 123. It would be the smart thing to do. It is now five minutes past one. We take only one. Okay. Oh, you, you need to speak. I think this should be the last word. Yeah. あの、きちっと処理をするんだということ
鑑識キャス,キャスクこれを検討するんだといったようなこと。今回の日米原子力協定を改定するかしないか、改定ではなく変更するかしないかということとは全く別にですね、今回のチャンスのとを利用して、日米政府はこういったことをしっかり、えー、脇でといいましょうかあの、合意をしとくということが非常にこれからにとって大事なことではないかなと思っています。So, uh... In conclusion, I would like to thank all of the people and organizations in Japan that made this event possible. We did not do very much here at NPEC. I think the bulk of the work was done in Japan to bring distinguished deputies here and the experts to share their views, which is something we needed to hear. And uh, the new uh, diplomacy initiative, the Citizens Nuclear Information Center, deserve a round. Oh, I'm sorry. Help me. Who's and our translator <laughs> deserve the last round of applause. You can talk amongst yourselves now. <laughs>